All right, you guys whew, have definitely seen the video that goes around the internet with some regularity of cats in space. Now, I don't know what Pete would do if I were to stick him in zero gravity. I feel like he'd probably freak out. But now I finally know why the Air Force took cats in zero gravity in the 1940s. So we're looking at that today on Vintage Space. But we're gonna put Pete down first because as much as we love him, he's really quite heavy, but he's so docile right now. It's so cute. All right, the footage in question here is this footage of cats in zero gravity. It's a 1947 test by the U.S. Air Force, and specifically the Behavioral Science Laboratory from the Aerospace Medical Research Laboratory at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. The test was run with cats and pigeons to see what these two animals, who normally have a very honed sense of directionality in space, would do when faced with a microgravity experiment. As we know and can see in this footage, if you pick up a cat and drop it, it naturally flips around its longitudinal axis to find the floor. This is where the saying of cats have nine lives comes from because they're always really good at finding out how to fall without hurting themselves. In a similar way, pigeons are very good at flying across distances. They don't generally fly towards the ground or, well, they fly up off the ground to get up into the air, but they're not flying up vertically. They understand where horizontal is from their perspective. But again, as we've seen in this footage, both those animals lose that sense of where they are and where their orientation is in a microgravity experiment. So this is all well and good, but how does this have any application beyond the fun of playing with kittens in an airplane doing parabolas? Well, in the 1940s and 1950s, the Air Force was starting to look at what might happen to a man going into space. So figuring out how a man could reorient himself in a zero gravity experiment was thought necessary if a pilot was going to be able to act and react within a spacecraft. But of course, scientists had to take into consideration that a man might be weightless far from any wall or any apparatus from which he could push himself off to gain momentum, to move, to spin, to get to where he had to be. It was necessary for scientists to develop some way for men to gain some kind of motion when in a weightless environment completely free of anything else. That way, if he was stuck in space somewhere, within the spacecraft of course, he'd be able to twist himself, turn, and somehow get himself back down to his control panel. So they looked in part at animals and how animals reorient themselves in zero gravity. In 1962, the same office out of the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base published a study about how different movements in a zero gravity environment, or a microgravity environment rather, could be used to affect motion in a man who was otherwise stationary. The study defines three axes of movement. The x-axis is the front to back axis going through the belly button, the y-axis is side to side going through the middle, and the z-axis is from head to toe, so that would be spinning around. And of course, these studies and other bioastronautical studies made their way to NASA in the early 1960s. When the Mercury astronauts were training for their space flights, part of their training included going up in a hollowed out airplane making parabolas to give them those short bursts of weightlessness. And they went through a lot of the exercises described in that 1962 paper from Wright-Patterson. The paper goes through full body movements, including standing up and then whipping one arm down to gain momentum. But it also looks at what you would do if only one part of your body was the moving object, such as rotating your arm really fast to gain momentum to start you spinning. The astronauts tried all of these things, and from the looks of it, they just had more fun than necessarily learned. The study goes through more than a dozen ways a man can move when floating in zero gravity to affect enough movement and gain enough momentum to actually move without being able to push off something in a spacecraft. And I'm not going to demonstrate all of them because that would be really hard and really awkward, but I have described them all in my latest blog post over on Vintage Space at Popular Science, so definitely check that out if you want to know how the Air Force decided that men would best move in a microgravity environment. All right, I know I literally just said that I wasn't gonna act at all of the movements, but the truth is I started writing the blog post and it's too funny not to act out all of these movements. So that video is going up tomorrow. It's also going up on Facebook. So check back because it is kind of weird and kind of fun. All right, back to the video. So was it useful for the astronauts to have all of these very defined movements in their brains to know how to move in space? I've talked to a few astronauts about this when I've had a chance to meet them, and so my answer to this one is anecdotal, but a lot of them say that once you get a handle on weightlessness, it becomes really easy to maneuver around. Of course, if you aren't near something, it's a little bit awkward, but you get used to it and you start to have an understanding of how to move your body in that environment. And I did hear the story, and I can't for the life of me remember who told me this, but that there are benefits, of course, too, to being in a microgravity environment when you're doing things like experiments in space. If you're working at a lab bench on Earth and you're at an awkward angle to try to make some piece of machinery move, you have to kind of, you know, awkwardly push yourself over it and try to make, make, get some torque, get some leverage, make it work. 
In space, if you can't get, you know, the top off something and you just need a better angle, you can just flip yourself upside down and get that better angle. Easy. So does that answer some questions about this weird footage of cats in space that seems to make the rounds on the internet? I hope so. But if not, leave me your questions in the comments below, as well as any other questions you might have about early astronaut training, bioastronautical research, and anything you want to see done on a later episode. Be sure to follow me on Twitter for daily vintage space content. And with new episodes going up Friday and the occasional bonus episode on Tuesdays, subscribe right here so you never miss an episode. I love you.